So hello, everybody. Yeah, let's welcome to uh, it's season number four that we're in. It's episode number two of Global Radio Ideas. It's our webinar series. And uh, great to see you guys again. My name is Ken Benson. I'm from P1 Media Group. We're a research and radio consulting company with clients around the world. And my co-host home at uh, the Benstown offices in Stuttgart, Germany today. Please welcome CEO Andy Sanneman. Hey, guys. Nice to meet you. Happy you're on. Phil. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar. Ally or Enemy, How Radio GPT Will Transform Radio. Exciting topic. Chat box is activated. Let us know where you're watching. And if you have a question, uh, post it. I'm pretty sure Daniel is going to take all the questions at the end of the show. And uh, like Ken said, there's going to be a couple. So um, let's dive right into it. So not only radio or GPT, is that an ally or enemy? I'm sure our guest today, some people may consider him an an ally or an enemy as well, and we'll know more by the end of the session. So let's tell you about the guest today. Uh, he's better known as a tech futurist, uh, passionate about the convergence between tech and media. But his passion for radio began at a very young age. He once said he, quote here, I eat, breathe, and sleep radio, which sounds like many of us. When he was only nine years old, he built a low-power transmitter reaching around 10 homes in his neighborhood and broadcast a three-hour call-in show in his basement. And I think this happened until the Fed showed up and maybe put a stop to that. He's shaking his head, yes. Uh, when he was in high school on Friday and Saturday nights, he would drag his equipment to the high school gym and provide play-by-play -play for football and basketball games, which the fans in the stands could hear on radio. He was also a very early uh, internet radio broadcaster. When he was only 15, he started his first internet-only station. Microsoft, a little company we may have heard of, took notice and actually invited him to speak in San Francisco at the Audio Engineering Society convention. Think about that at 15. Uh, since high school, he's continued to lead and innovate, and we want to share a few of his accomplishments. Uh, many of you probably are familiar with listener-driven radio. He's the guy behind that. He holds a few patents, somewhere around 18 is what I last read. And he advises uh, major media companies like the Wall Street Journal, CBS News, and iHeartRadio. Today, he's the founder and CEO of Futuri, a leading provider of cloud-based audience engagements and sales intelligence software for media companies. And last count, I think, was over 5,000 stations around the world. From Cleveland, Ohio, the home of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, please welcome our guest today, Daniel and Stendig. All right, awesome. Good to see you guys. Thank you for that intro. That was an introduction. So, I mean, as you guys all know, I like like diving right into it. So, Daniel, awesome you're here. Thanks for that. Before we jump into the make more meat to the bone, like before we jump into Li or Enemy, so how radio GPT will transform radio, you know, my favorite question, guys, is always, let's begin by telling us something people may not know about you. Obviously, Ken shared common knowledge and accomplishments. I'm more like for the nitty gritty. I really want to know, like, what's going on with, with Daniel. And I'm sure Daniel has, like, some great anecdotes for us to share here. <laughs> well, uh, well, thank you. And it's really fun to be here. And I see so many familiar names and, and faces in the chat room. So uh, really excited for today's conversation. Um, so I started Futuri 14 years ago, and today we do work with over 5,000 media executives and, and, and uh, stations around the world. Uh, and it just gives us a very unique perspective about where radio is going. So I'm excited for the conversation. Um, something you may not know about me, uh, after I sold our company to Microsoft when I was 18, I did go uh, to work for various broadcast companies, including uh, the, the famous and fabulous Mike McVeigh and Clear Channel worked as an advisor for Wall Street Journal and CBS TV. But very few people know that uh, I grew up with a mom as a uh, music therapist. And so I played drums and keyboard from a very young age. And I've actually written and published over 200 songs and produced wow. music for various artists in different sync licensing uh, scenarios and for different artists who have, uh, you know, created their own albums. And my band is called Rhythm and Truth. You can find uh, Rhythm and Truth on any of That's your awesome. favorite streaming platforms. And uh, we have over three and a half million spins on Spotify. So uh, wow. that's, that's my, my, fun, uh, my, my fun time outside of media and technology. Hey, you're catching up with Miley Cyrus. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Have All right, so let's get to right go. to it, Daniel. It's great to have you here. There's a lot of people interested in what you're going to say today, uh, but let's get right to it. February 24th, Futuri released a press release 
introducing radio GPT to the radio industry around the world. And it sent shockwaves everywhere. And I think one thing that's evident from the introduction today that you love radio. I mean, I don't think you created this to mess up radio, but to improve it. So tell us how Radio GPT is going to help radio going forward. Well, I believe that Radio GPT can enhance the brilliant creative work that we do in radio. Here's, here are a couple of hard truths about our business. If you look across the radio industry today, you would scarcely find live talent in nights or overnights that isn't syndicated. You would scarcely find weekends that have live talent on the air uh, 24-7. And you would find a handful of veteran morning shows that are you know, tracking or broadcasting their show from a centralized location and trying to reach millions of people. And, and that is a very different scenario than the radio industry that we all grew up in. And so I believe that, first of all, radio has, by and large, surrendered non-prime day parts to streamers. And just because you love the morning show, if you're a dedicated listener, a loyal listener, just because you love the morning show, that doesn't mean that you're going to keep listening through the day or, uh, or through the weekend and so on and so forth. So if the content between the songs isn't relevant outside of your one or two live day parts, then there's a lot of opportunity for us as broadcasters. I believe that Radio GPT can uh, either extend our existing talent or create new interesting talent that uh, fill in these day parts that we don't have live talent on. Uh, uh, just a, a quick note, on the day that we released Radio GPT, it's all too ironic that Spotify went public with their AI DJ on the very same day. And I think we have to look in the mirror in our industry and say, you know, that, look, uh, Spotify, uh, Apple Music, um, Amazon Music, these, these groups and these streaming providers look at the broadcast industry and they see a big, sleepy well of time spent listening that they can target. So I believe that radio needs to use AI. And, and, and I'm not just talking about creating AI DJs. Radio GPT goes far um, beyond just having an AI voice on the air. It actually is an AI-powered personality, which I'm happy to, to help you uh, or to, to explain and kind of help you see some different applications for Radio GPT today. But I believe that AI needs to become a foundational part of what we do in this business. Because if we asked ourselves today wh what we would do in the radio industry if radio were invented today, after social, after, the, after cloud computing, after... Uh, the digital revolution, it would be a no brainer for us to have artificial intelligence as a key component of everything we do from content creation to audience targeting and audience growth and marketing to even revenue and sales. And yet in this industry, we have this uh, bit of resistance to embracing technology. It's not just AI. We have a bit of resistance to embracing technology altogether, uh, you know, across, across our business. And I think that this is an important moment for us to, to really get our arms around it and use technology as an advantage to grow our content and our audience and our revenue. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think the resistance is kind of like a usual thing, no matter what industry you're looking at, like new things always get rejected. And I, I love the analogy um, that you made that if radio would invent it today, be invented today, I think that's the that's a perfect mindset to think about those. I mean, Daniel, uh, we had it before a little bit. So obviously, you know, I saw you speaking in, in, in Prague at Radio Days and great convention, good people. Um, obviously, everyone was talking about GPT at the conference. That was an understatement and it was the big topic. So the potential of for Radio GPT to improve radio as you like started a little bit like uh, pointing out is, is, is enormous. I think we're all, um, we're all like having consensus here, but what would be like your concerns about radio GPT though? What do you think could be the downside? Like if there is any, in your opinion, like what could be the danger because danger and AI is kind of like a topic that so many people are honing in on. So what as a founder, as the inventor, what do you think, um, could be the downside? Well, so I, I've, I've been involved in development of artificial intelligence for several years. And so we can talk about downside, not only with uh, systems like Radio GPT, but Absolutely. With, artif with artificial intelligence in general. Uh, but I'll give you this headline. When we start talking about downside, I'm not worried about artificial intelligence. I'm more worried about human stupidity. <laughs> and <laughs> what, what I mean by that is that 
you know, we uh, as a culture, we are grossly underestimating the impact that artificial intelligence can have in virtually every aspect of our lives and in all the right ways and the wrong ways. Um, there's a there's a book that I would highly recommend called Scary Smart it's, uh, by a, an author named Mo Gadot. Scary Smart is all about the future of artificial intelligence and how it's going to basically infiltrate our lives. And one of the facts that has been uh, discussed and, and debated around artificial intelligence circles and uh, around, you know, tech, across technology is how soon we will reach a time when AI basically reaches general, generalized intelligence. You know, in other words, how soon is it autonomous and can basically think more effectively than we can as humans? And there are estimates ranging from 2025 to 2029 to 2040. But one thing that everybody agrees on is that generally by 2049, artificial intelligence will be about a billion times smarter than humans. And to put that in context, think about this. A billion times different is like the difference between Albert Einstein and a housefly. So that's very powerful. <laughs> And, and if we think that governments are going to regulate this effectively or that there will be a set of rules that we can all agree on around this, we're fooling ourselves. It's going to be up to us as citizens. Uh, I mean, I'm speaking more broadly than radio and the broadcast community. It will be up to us as citizens to determine the guidelines around which AI is acceptable for use and what is not acceptable. So I do think that when you talk about downside, what's the downside for radio GPT in broadcasting? Really, that's a question that everybody on this call is going to answer, because whether you're using Radio GPT or whether you are using artificial intelligence as part of your sales and commercialization efforts, you will be working with artificial intelligence in the coming years. The question is, how are you going to do it and how are you going to do it in, in a way that is constructive, that outweighs the potential downside or limitations? I think one potential downside of Radio GPT is somebody saying, great, now I can just eliminate all human talent uh, and we can just have AI DJs. That's not the spirit of why we created Radio GPT. We created Radio GPT so that we could extend the superpower of talent in our industry and create more live and local and entertaining day parts. I also think that, you know, it, the, one of the downsides is that we say, okay, uh, it's going to be the most reliable thing in a crisis. And we can just depend on AI to help us uh, in severe weather events or, you know, when there's a, a natural disaster. I still think nobody is better than a human in a crisis in the studio. And so really AI should become our super producer. It should be our greatest help in the studio. It should be our greatest co-host. It should fill in the blanks where we don't have live talent. Um, AI cannot go stuff a bus. It can't do endorsement campaigns. It can't hug a listener. These are things that humans can do. So if I were an air talent today, and I've, I've been on the air before, I would be thinking that my priority is relationships, relationships in the community with audiences, relationships with my advertisers to go generate revenue. I'd be thinking about building relationships in my community so that I become a, an important staple of my brand. And I think that our industry has not really supported air talent. Again, if we're just speaking truthfully here in our, uh, you know, under our, our, <laughs> the circle of trust here today, I mean, our industry has not necessarily supported talent to go out and do these types of things in the community. We put jocks in a dark room, in a four by four room uh, booth and have them, you know, run voice tracks all day that are going to air hours or days from now, thousands of miles away. And I think that's a mistake. I think that ultimately we should be using AI to augment what we can do live and what we can do in our local communities and continue to embrace this mindset that if radio were invented after smartphones and social and AI and cloud computing and so on, we would be thinking really methodically about how we use our people to create human relationships and, and the most important sticky thing that we have, which is relationships with our audience and our advertisers and using AI to make ourselves efficient and entertaining and to fill in the gaps where we can't be as, as humans. I'm still struck by a billion times smarter. <laughs> it's unfathomable. <laughs> it's, the it's potential is enormous. Yeah, it, it is. It is. And, you know, and, and I, I think that, you know, there are already ways that AI is already in our lives and we don't even realize it. I mean, it's a yeah. it's a significant part of the healthcare industry now. It's a growing and very important part of education. Uh, I mean, personally, I am embracing it 
I believe this is the most exciting time to be alive in my heart. I mean, I know that it can be scary for people. I also know that there are ways that, you know, <laughs> when just about every new advancement has been introduced, there's always fear and there's always this uh, stigma around it. I was talking with uh, a family member over the weekend who told me that, you know, when she's 96 years old and she said, you know, when I was a kid and TV started to become a thing, there was talk in our neighborhood that it was like an unholy device because how could this thing possibly have people in it? It's like, it's a demonic device. There's, there's little people. It's capturing the essence of people in the TV. I mean, come on now. Uh, I, there are, <laughs> there are probably many, many stories of these types of, uh, you know, of advancements where, you know, when a new technology is introduced, there's always this kind of, uh, you know, fear or pushback, but ultimately we come out better, more productive and more happy humans as a result of this type of tech in our lives. So I believe that AI will be, will live a similar story. And I think we'll look back on 2023 and we'll say there was a life before GPT and there was a life after GPT. Mm -hmm. Uh, because now that ChatGPT is here, which has become so enormously popular so fast, I think now in our consciousness, we understand how AI can be helpful to us and what it can do to make our lives better. And we're starting to adopt that in, in all kinds of ways. I personally am, I would rather go see a doctor who is assisted by AI when they're looking at my x-rays. I mean, I would rather have my kids go to an educator who is unafraid to use AI to teach and tutor and specialize education for you know for for their specific learning style and i think in radio we have to adopt it and say we would rather be the broadcasters who are using ai to create the most entertaining informative sticky content that we possibly can and and minimize the amount of time there's no time for defensiveness right now uh because every every streaming and tech first competitor is going to use every advantage they have including ai to come after our audiences and our advertisers so we can dismiss all the debates now about whether it's going to uh, take jobs or be unreliable or, you know, have bias and so on. Yeah, it's going to have all of those things. And it's up to us to shape it, control it, and ultimately to integrate it rather than resist it. Okay. So let's talk about actor and TV host Drew Carey for a moment. He hosts a radio show on Sirius XM Radio. And recently he used AI, not your system from what I understand, and used chat GPT to write his scripts for the show. And he said in an interview after this show aired, so basically it was, it was a virtual version of a show, all right? He said, quote, I violated a rule from Radio 101. The reason FM stations and treasured radio stations still make money is because people like the personality of the DJs. And then he went on to say, uh, when the message got out to his fans and he came clean, they basically came back to him and said, you can't do that again. Uh, how do you respond to Drew's comments? Well, I, I was heated about it. Uh, and, and I love Drew Carey. He's a fellow, fellow Clevelander. So, you know, of course, how could I not love Drew? Um, but, you know, I wasn't surprised that his experiment failed for a couple of reasons. And I, I actually wrote a response about this that you can find on my LinkedIn. And I, I think it also was um, referenced in Radio Inc., my headline on it is that quality counts and transparency counts. And that's where Drew Carey fell down on this. I think that he and his producer were well-intentioned and they thought, uh, we're being so clever. We're going to be the first AI-powered Drew Carey show. We're going to be, the, we're gonna be uh, you know, a, a fun and interesting show. And then we're going to tell people afterwards that it was AI and we're just going to blow their minds. But what they didn't think about is that they went and cloned their voice on, uh, you know, some cheap, you know, voice cloning site. And there's going to be a lot of that out there. Uh, and then they also didn't tell the audience what they were doing. And I think quality and transparency is where they failed. Um, this is this is a misconception also about Radio GPT that I think needs to be cleared up. I think they, they brought something to light. When we created Radio GPT, we didn't just go pluck a, a voice replicator out, offline and uh, hook it up to chat GPT. We've been developing AI voices since 2019. We've, developing, we've been developing Topic Pulse since 2011, which scans Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and over 250,000 news sources. So it can show you what's trending in a local market. That's easier said than done. There are a lot of parameters that you and, and considerations that you have to have in mind to know that what it's scanning and what it's reporting is really broadcast friendly. And then the AI voices that are generated ultimately and injected back into an automation system have to be top quality, broadcast ready. 
And, and I think also, if you're going out there today and you're thinking that you're so clever, you're going to launch an AI voice track show, and then you're going to tell the audience that, you, that that's what you did, I think you're setting yourself up for a, a rude awakening, the way that Drew Carey did. I, I think that personalities who fully clone their shows should be transparent with the audience. If you are doing a full day part and it is AI powered, just tell the audience that that's what it is. They'll be intrigued. Um, I think that if you're doing service elements like weather, news, traffic, a lot of our Radio GPT clients and, uh, and partners are launching with weather, traffic, news, entertainment reports, and, and service elements that are hyper-local. In that case, I don't think you're, in, you're under any obligation to tell everybody exactly how your weather forecasts are produced. But if you're cloning a beloved personality like a Drew Carey and you're trying to pull a fast one, you know, you're going to get you're going to get into trouble. And and I think that's what happened, unfortunately, for Drew. I think he he kind of uh, in his you know earnestness to do something cool, just kind of stepped on a landmine. Uh, but this is this is not just, you know, Radio GPT is not just cloning a voice and then typing something in clever to chat GPT, feeding it to your voice cloning or text to speech engine and having it voiced on the air. Our system is integrated into your automation system. It's looking at what's scheduled. It's watching what's trending in your local market with Topic Pulse. It is using GPT-4 to then script or conversationalize what is happening in, in your market. But then the AI voice is also not just an off-the-shelf cloner. It is actually looking at the sentiment of what you're talking about or of the story or, or narrative that it's, that it's uh, speaking about. And it's making that voice sentiment and expressiveness change based on the topic that it's discussing. And so this is nuance that we've been developing for years. And it's not, to us, it's not a PR stunt and it's not a, it's not a, you know, promotional weekend gag. It is a serious implementation of artificial intelligence into our operating strategies as broadcasters to help us create more live and local content that builds audience. And I think that's the difference between what maybe Drew Carey and his producer were trying to do versus what our team of 120 plus people at Futuri have been working on for several years. Yeah, I think to Drew's defense, he didn't, I think he didn't want to replicate what you guys were doing. He just wanted, in my opinion, not ever spoken to Drew about this before, but I think he just wanted to replicate a kind of workflow, how, how this could work like for, I don't want to say an amateur, but like on an amateur level, right? Like we all, Beside you, obviously know what you're doing, but like when ChatGPT came out, like amateurs in AI, like me, were also going online and playing around. And I think he was playing around with it basically more than like trying to to replicate um, what you guys have done or what you have done. I think it's a really what you said about transparency is kind of like is really the key to the to the element here, right? So the question is like, where does this transparency transparency stops? And where it starts and you made a good comment like with the weather and the traffic already i think that that's why like a lot of this discussion gets like more heated and more like emotional because there's a lot of like sentiments and a lot of like hard feelings like in this type of in, in this type of content production and at the end of the day like it's personal it's not going to change because jet gpt radio gpt like all this system is going to do what they do anyways no matter how we personally feel about it and i think that's kind of like the point well, I really think, Ken, we should uh, skip the next question because Daniel already already answered already answered most of it. I think it's something that's going to happen, no matter how we personally or the user personally, the the, the DJ, the jock, how we want to call the person, like uh, feels about it. It's going to happen anyway. So it's rather you like thinking about strategies to implement and work ethically and honestly with it, or we all still happen anyways. So I think that's why we really could like ditch the next question, Ken, and then really okay. jump on to the next one. So I just want to mention, if you're joining us late here, we are speaking with Daniel and Stendig. He's the CEO of Futuri and uh, one of the masterminds behind Radio GPT. I'm sure you have some questions. If you do, uh, please type them in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can in, in just a few minutes. So uh, the next question I, I had for you, Daniel, is, uh, you know, I've listened to your sample stream on, on your website. You know, I think it sounds pretty good, but is it ready for prime time? Yes. <laughs> yes. I, so, um, I, yes. And I would, I would encourage a wide variety of prime time uses. So, yes, I think it can be used for full day parts. 
Um, but I also think it can be used for service elements, local weather, news. If I had day parts with a solo host, I'd be thinking about building a panel of co-hosts powered by AI. Uh, by the end of this year, we have several broadcasters who will be on the air with Radio GPT in a wide range of use cases. And it's really, um, it's, you know, it really is going to be specific to that local station. So we have over 100 voices in our what we call our voice choice library that broadcasters can choose from. And we also can clone human voices. And you, you probably have heard examples of clones on our live stream. Uh, and the, you know, the difference between a human clone voice these days with our technology versus a uh, live talent is hardly discernible. Still, I wouldn't lie about it if you were doing an entire show. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I do think that it will be used more and more in prime day parts as well as service elements. And to me, to Drew's point, the reaction he had from his audience, um, do you think radio will, will face that over the long haul where people will just reject the premise that it's, in their mind, a synthetic voice? I don't think that people will have the same. I think it's one thing when you're cloning a personality who's beloved, uh, a Drew Carey. I don't think it's the same when you know it's a synthetic voice. Um, I mean, it hasn't stopped millions of people around the world from using their Siri or Alexa yeah. or, you know, any other smart speaker. And, and, and really, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest challenges that we face in radio right now is that we do a lot of research at Futuri. Every year we do studies with Nielsen, with Smith Geiger uh, on the TV side. We have uh, a partnership with the University of Florida with their College of Journalism and Communications for many years now. We do research with Gen Z and uh, with the up and coming talent in the broadcast industry. And, and what we see in research over and over again is that audiences want more content than ever. I mean, the, they have a voracious appetite for content. We all spend more time on our screens than ever before. Okay, honest question. How many of you on this webinar have also consumed content from at least two other screens at the same time? I mean, look at us. Our audiences are no different. And so audiences want more content than ever, and we have fewer people. So we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of moving in the opposite direction. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and that's where to AI make a can point be here, to us. Absolutely. But to make a point here, like the, the wanting more content also leads to wanting more average content, which is kind of like, in my opinion, and obviously you stated it's prime time, but in my opinion, what I see, like if I'll use uh, 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 ChatGPT, for entertainment purposes or what I try to basically do with chat GPT for entertainment purposes, most of the stuff that I get back, if I say, Hey, write me some radio liners, do this, do this. Even if I get really specific and I'll play around with it a fair bit, we are in that version, like in my opinion, on a still average level, but which is going to continue to get better. And it, depending on the time frame, going to be better sooner or later. So my question, I think leads down to that point. We'll see Italy, for example, banned it. China doesn't allow it, which, I mean, it's not a surprise, right? I mean, we know that's going to happen. China does not allow a lot of things. They will build their own. The U.S. government is discussing oversight rules. We said before, like, <laughs> this is going to work. Like, I highly doubt it. You highly doubt it. I bet, like, everyone on that, like, webinar is going to highly doubt it. But there is some justification, I think, in the concerns that are people, that are people raising. And the question is... In our mind, obviously, we all want to be ethical, and I truly believe in, in the uh, knowing you now and, and seeing like how, how you deal with that stuff, being a radio lover, that obviously, like depending on the p person who is overseeing the operation, the company will be like that, that concern is not justified. But <laughs> will AI be stopped and regulated in certain territories? I, I guess that's something that's, that's going to happen, but to what degree do you think yeah. that's going to happen and what's going to be the outcome? Because obviously North Korea is not going to stop their AI development because we in the United States or Germany think it's not, not the right thing to do, right? <laughs> right. So right. That, that, thing, well, that thing is going to move, you know? It's well, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, outright banning or stopping AI is not the best solution. Regulation and oversight can help to ensure that AI is developed and used ethically and responsibly, but... As we all know, government, not just our government in the U.S., but any government moves at a, a turtle's pace. And so I think AI is far more likely to revolutionize government than the other way around. And 
Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's just the cold truth of it. I, I do find it entertaining that after Italy banned GPT, chat GPT, that there was a, an incredible spike in VPN usage in Italy, which just yeah, means absolutely. that citizens <laughs> found their way around I mean, because they want that's... chat GPT. <laughs> so that's the same so, remember when you were a kid when basically a cd got the parental advisory sticker like that right, cd right. got like purchased the most so it's kind of like the same thing right that's exactly right that's exactly right i think that every government official has uh, you know woken up recently to the need for responsible ai development and use uh the tech industry you know elon musk recently wrote this open letter about uh proposing a six-month moratorium on any more complex artificial intelligence beyond gpt4 um, I did sign the letter, although uh, typical to Elon Musk, there's always an ulterior motive. And, you know, days later, it came out that Twitter is actually working more aggressively than ever on AI development. Um, and I think that just makes the point that, you know, we can all agree that, yes, it's getting um, it's it's getting more serious and that AI will have a, a real material impact on our lives. But slowing down doesn't seem to be an option. I think adopting, adapting are the are is really the mandate here. And and I, I do think that if the U.S., as an example, came to an agreement to somehow create a verifiable moratorium on AI development beyond GPT-4, it would create a national security disadvantage because, uh, you know, who else is going to really stop? And I think that's the, you know, th these are concerns about AI in general. Um, look, I, I think that it's a very exciting time in our lives to to see what AI is capable of doing. And it's really going to become important for us as citizens to be uber informed and ultimately to help shape its usage. Yeah. That's, that's, that's really the, you know, engaged citizens are really the answer here. So, so Daniel, I want to ask you a question. Um, if you were a program director today um, and you obviously learning about radio GPT, what would you do and how would you implement that at your station right now? What would you do? Well, it would be, I'll start with Radio GPT and then I'll talk about AI in general. So first with Radio GPT, I would use it to make the day parts where I don't have live talent, fresh, locally relevant, and completely kick ass. I'd have service elements on the air 24 seven with local weather and news. I would make sure that Radio GPT has um, specific demo targeted content based on what's trending in my market 24 seven, multiple times per hour. If I had day parts with a solo host, I would think creatively about creating a panel of co-hosts that are powered by Radio GPT. So if I have a solo, if I have a midday in the morning uh, scenario, I would use Radio GPT to create a fun and interesting health reporter, a fun and interesting entertainment report, a fun and interesting, uh, you know, movies slash pop culture, uh, you know, type report and so on. And I would create different personalities. So within Radio GPT, when you set up a new voice, you select a voice or you can clone a human voice. And then you give it an age because an age gives a personality life perspective. We think differently at 20 than we do at 40. So you give it an age. And then in Radio GPT in the back end, you give it character traits. So you would say, I am creating Tracy. Tracy is 42. She's fun loving, enthusiastic, and she's bold. And then I'm creating John. John is 35 and he is uh, reserved and uh, he is cautious and uh, he's skeptical. So I would create different personalities like this and then find different subject matter that I, as the midday and the morning host or a solo host, uh, could kind of throw out to my uh, to my AI co-hosts and create interactive and fun uh, moments on the air with the AI. And I don't know that I would be so cheeky about not telling people that it's AI. I, I would probably go right out there and and do it and tell people that it's it's an AI assisted you know type show. Uh, you know, and, and look today, the voices that you hear on radio GPT are extremely human. Like we like to say that we're living more in the West world territory in terms of the voice quality at this point, and they're the worst they're ever going to be. So every day right. I see our machine learning team making improvements, yeah. improvements, improvements, and it's getting more and more humanistic. So I'd be thinking about that, but, um, uh, there are other ways that I would be thinking about using AI also. If, would you like me to talk about those? Also, coming back to the voice really quick, like, I think that's also our understanding, right? So, like, our generation's understanding, because our kids grew up with AI voices on TikTok and on, like, all the smart speakers, and they have a very different objective, like, to those voices than, than we are having, actually. So, if you ask your son, or if I'd ask my son, he's 13 years old, 
about the voice quality, his, his opinion would be totally different. And that's basically the gener next generation who's going to use content and services and so on and so on. So I think yeah. that's a very that's a very significant thing we all need to lean in and think about because like our hat like that we have to put up might be a little bit outdated because we did not grow up with these type of voices. As you see, like every second YouTube video these days, my kids are watching has an artificial voice. Every TikTok video has an artificial voice. So their understanding right. is very, very different than our understanding to that topic. That's something we also should <laughs> excellent not forget. Excellent point. That's an excellent point. Spend five seconds on TikTok and you're going to hear yeah. artificial voices that are way, way more artificial than anything you'll hear out of radio. Absolutely. TV. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So want to get to some questions because we certainly have okay. a few to get to. Uh, just want to touch on a couple of the podcasts you do that I think people in this group will find quite interesting and fascinating to keep up on AI and what's going on with tech and media. So tell us about these two programs you do. Okay, there are two podcasts. The first is And Standing on the Business of Content. So this is all about the business of content, whether you are a in mainstream media or you're in radio or you're building a personal content empire. And the whole premise here is that there is no audience without content and there's no business without audience. So we talk about everything from using artificial intelligence to create your content all the way to new distribution and promotional ideas. Uh, the second podcast is called Future Daily. And Future Daily is two minutes or less every day, staying up to date on the latest developments in AI. And uh, it's quick and, and uh, you know, you can add it to your daily brief on Alexa and it will keep you up to date with what's happening in the world of AI around us. Fantastic. Yeah, definitely uh, be sure to check those out. All right, so let's give us some questions, Daniel. First comes from uh, KC. It says, hi, Daniel, do you have an African, or do you have African voices or is it the stage now where it's primarily Anglo-centric? So we do have, uh, yes, we do have African voices. Um, we have a wide range of voices in our voice choice library, over 100 that you can choose from. And we can also clone a voice. And we support uh, multiple languages. Once we have a, a base model for language, then we can adapt that model to be uh, specific to uh, local accent or local di dialect. So we do have several different accents from African countries. Um, and we're always training on new accents. I, I you know, I was born in Pittsburgh, uh, and for part of my childhood, I lived in Biloxi, Mississippi. So what my personal barometer is, it has to be able to speak uh, in terms of American English, has to be able to speak Pittsburgh, has to be able to speak Biloxi uh, in, in, uh, in the U.S. And we know that there are similar examples of different dialects and regionalities that need to be mastered by the system around the world. And so we're always pursuing that. So, yeah. so is it at a point where they should contact you now if they're interested yes. for their market in Africa? Okay, great. Yes. Perfect. So I think there's a lot of question coming in from Harry Lack, who is a very well-respected voice over talent and obviously also the voice for my CHR library that I produce. And um, Harry, I think, uh, is really emotional about the topic, which, I mean, I understand. Um, he basically said, said, I don't like the word surrender with regards to what radio companies have done with certain day parts and having live talent. Have you looked at Australia, for example, Southern Cross Stereo, that has just invested tons in amazing new studios in multiple markets and has very sizable staff with multiple show producers, imagers, and more radios thriving there. This seems to be a North American problem. And rather than swing it to the extreme, as has happened here, perhaps the corporate types might realize that they screwed themselves with gutting talent. There is no talent bench worth speaking of. Things should swing back to a point rather than degrade further and further. I don't see AI helping to enhance a talent bench. It is rare to meet a younger person that has the passion and excitement to get into radio as you and I had have. I think there is obvious use of AI, but we know how the corporate bean counters can be, and I fear it will go too far. I'd like to go live uh, against uh, AI. So that's a pretty bold statement. I understand like where this is coming from. And, and yeah. I, I, I would agree on certain points. But again, I'm also of your opinion, like even just because we feel um, that we should all go back to nature and like uh, be esoteric about the good spirits and like inhale like fresh air is not going to change the pollution as well. This is not going to change like what's going to happen with AI. So um, what will your response uh, be to, to a bold statement like that? Well, well, first of all, hey to Harry. Uh, and secondly, I, I, I look forward to the first big morning show battle between an AI show and a human show. I think it's going to be hilarious and I can't wait for it. 
and um, and I think it'll be very entertaining. I think the I think radio will be better for it, and I think the listeners will win, and the ratings will be great. So I look forward to that day, and and I um, am eager to see Radio GPT on the AI side of that. Not because the humans are bad, just because it'll be entertaining. Um, yeah. I do agree, uh, Harry, that there hasn't been an, an adequate investment in a talent bench. I mean, nobody would disagree with that. And yeah. good for Southern Cross, uh, but that's not the case everywhere. And there's so much talent out there. I have huge respect for radio talent. I also don't see live people coming back to the day parts that, are, that now don't have live talent. And one way for AI right. to enhance what live personalities do is to surround them by end-to-end -end live local content in day parts that would otherwise be all sweepers or all voice tracks. Um, and there's also ways that AI can enhance what a live talent can do. So in the example of Topic Pulse, even if you're not using Radio GPT, you could use our Topic Pulse system to look at what's trending in your market and click a button to automatically create a first draft talking points about a trending topic yeah. or it's automatically a create a social post. So these it's are, these are yeah, that's a helper scenario and, a, and the ultimate producer scenario. So you mentioned an AI morning show in a battle with a traditional human morning show. Yeah, I'd like um, to see that too. Kyle and Jackie O. Yeah. Do we stay in Australia. Kyle and Jackie O against Radio GPT. I'm going to email Chris Davis, who is producing like for Kiss, like and, and Kyle and Jack. And if there's something they would be interested in, I think that'd be like a really fun thing. Um, do you think it'll be do. that good at some point soon where, where we can run with that and, and people won't know the difference or, or really care? I, I do. Yes. <laughs> yes, wow. I do. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's there now. It's a matter of, uh, of getting it on the air in the right competitive situation. Yes. Wow. That's amazing. Um, because it's always been radio. I mean, the strength is that human emotional connection. And now will people have that emotional connection knowing that it's a robot? But but thinking about like the AI, like basically throw some Joe Rogan kind of jokes at you, jokes at you like all the time, and you'll basically have to surrender because obviously you are the fly, and the AI is like a billion times smarter than you. It's kind of like a scary scenario. So <laughs> I don't want to be insulted by like an AI DJ with the knowledge of Albert Einstein. So I think it's a really interesting topic. Um, it's fascinating, and and it's something to embrace, in my opinion. And it's not going to change well, the talent bench either. Like we're not going to get more talents just because we don't use AI. That's kind of like my take on it. The the yes. more like I'd love to support local talent. We've always done that, Ben Stone, and I think we've been one of the biggest supporters in radio ever. But uh, I, I'll think uh, Daniel's point, if it's like a real helper for that system, is really fascinating, and I think that's uh, that's the right approach. Um, to do that. I think it's, it's really you know, fascinating. There are also ways, just in terms of thinking about extending uh, air personalities and ex extending our superpowers, uh, one of the things that we are working on now that we have coming in the next month is automatic voice-to-voice -voice translation using Radio GPT. So imagine that you're, uh, use, you're, you're an English show, but you want to also be simulcast uh, or automatically translated on your HD2 in Spanish. Um, our system is... Fun we, we have functional voice models in Spanish, German, Polish, Italian, French, Portuguese, and English. And wow. so, you know, you can imagine the, the reach of, uh, a, of a broadcaster who before was only in one language, but now yeah. could create their show in other languages. So there's, it, you know, beyond competition, there are also ways that we can use it to just extend our reach and become more powerful across a broader audience. So just a couple more questions. We'll wrap up because I know you have a very busy and tight schedule as you uh, launch this product around the world. Uh, obviously, we had the question before about, is this available in African voices? There's some other questions coming in. Is it available in Spanish? Is it available in Middle Eastern languages? So these people should just contact you and your company because the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, so it's, it's English. Today, it's, it's English, Spanish, German, Polish, uh, Italian, French, and Portuguese. Uh, we have done some work with Middle Eastern languages, uh, by the way, the most complex languages on the on the planet. So uh, we're being very methodical with our machine learning team on on uh, tracking with languages like Arabic uh, and, and Hebrew and so on. And these are difficult languages to master. So uh, we're you know, th there will be a bit longer to get there. But uh, the other languages that I mentioned are available this spring. OK, great. Uh I want to ask you about celebrity voice clones. We have a question from Mike. It says, what do you think the potential legal implications are for stations that might be uh, trying this out? Yeah, if you, uh, just use Pink's voice and like not getting sued for it. It's going to be really interesting. 
Yes, yes. Okay, well, well, first of all, um, I would say that you should not clone a voice without uh, specific permission from that, from that talent. I saw that Trisha Yearwood just had an unauthorized voice clone for some Keto Gummies product, uh, and that's horrible. I would feel violated if somebody did that. And there are a lot of terrible ways to use lots of different types of tech, and we need systems and structure for that, too. At, at Futuri, we only clone human voices where we have a signed affidavit from the talent that gives us permission yeah. to do that. Otherwise, we don't go cloning their voice. Uh, and, um, and I think that should be a general best practice in audio and, yeah. and in broadcasting. I mean, it's going to get a copyright. There's going to be a copyright rule like for music down the road. I mean, because it's basically the same type of scenario, same type of thing than pictures and music and, and everything. So, um, so so last one I had, I just had a text from someone that didn't want to be named, but they said, uh, so this can be good enough to compete and possibly outperform a human morning show. So are you suggesting it will replace live talent? I do think that there will be scenarios where live talent are replaced by Radio GPT. It's not the reason that we created Radio GPT. It's not something that we want to do or to see happen. I would rather see Radio GPT used to extend the powers of live talent. Uh, but yes, I do think that there are scenarios where people will say, um, you know, yeah, I'm going to go with AI on this yeah. show or on this station. Uh, and um you know, and, and that there will be a bit of a rotation. But look, if you are an air talent that is working harder to be better than AI and you have relationships and you're developing relationships with your audience and with your advertisers, then you're irreplaceable. Uh, I mean, I, I really do believe that. Uh, you know, Valerie Geller said recently that if you are working harder and you're better than AI, if you're doing the job, it'll be very hard to replace you. But if you are lazy without a good deal of personality or humor or show prep and you're not focused on offering the audience a unique journey or new info or genuine human companionship well then yeah a computer announcer could probably replace you and yeah, i but, think that's where we're at but that's going to be the case in every i mean that's going to be the case in every scenario at least like you as a human being and i don't want to really don't want to break like all like uh, the lens for ai here but like, think about the attorney. Like, what should an attorney say? Like, an average attorney, like, in five years? I mean, it's not going to happen with AI. An average radiologist in five years is not going to happen with AI. So that's going to happen anyways to all industries, like, where a computer could do the job better. The question is, and I think radio has a big, or you, every presenter has, like, a big opportunity here to basically get out of his comfort zone, like, embrace that human connection. And, and like, like you said, the social connection he can make with his listeners, with, his coworkers and then just get out of it better by using those systems. I think that's the only way um, to, to do it because this is not, not going to be any way around. And to Harry's point, I mean, Harry's right. There's going to be big beam counters, but the beam counter is going to be there anyway. They're going to basically automate this, this show anyway. If it's with Jet GPT or without, that's what I found like really interesting in your presentation. I spoke to a couple of German guys after it. And they were basically saying, I'll see this as a supportive thing because we don't have like any talents anyway on the air. Certain hours is better than just having automation. So I'll have something. I think that's uh, as a first step, at least like it's going to shape in radio and make it better. And I think that's what we all here for. That's why all these people come to that webinars to learn and to see they, how they can stay into the game and, and make radio better and make their profession make them better that profession, you know, that they're loved so much. Yeah. So. Well, and, you know, as a general rule, I don't go right to the, I don't go right to the scenario where radio GPT or AI replaces every human in our industry. I, I think that's a, I think that's a pretty extreme scenario. I, yeah. In short, I mean, I don't, I don't see people being replaced by AI. I see people being replaced by people using AI. And that first, when we as an industry, if you're from a competitive perspective, if you're adopting artificial intelligence uh, like Radio GPT to extend your best personalities or you're using Topic Pulse to be a super producer or you're using Post to take uh, all of your uh, talk breaks and automatically make them social and uh, podcasting on demand uh, entertainment, I, I see more, uh, you know, I see that being the more competitive case than just saying, okay, now we're going to uh, put iRobot on the air 24 <laughs> seven. That's, yeah. you know, that's a little, that's a little dystopian future for me. And I'm more of an optimist, but, um, but, you know, yes, I do think that there, there will be a job rotation in virtually every industry. I, yeah. and that's why I say, we'll look back on this year and we will see a pre GPT and a post GPT line in our lives because, 
every industry, every, everybody we know is going to be adopting artificial intelligence in one way or another to be uh, more effective, more efficient, um, and ultimately, uh, you know, better at what we do. And I think that's a great thing. It's, it, that excites me more than it scares me. And, and also, I think we should really, and, and, and that may be, may be the closer, we should really look back at this like in a year and have the same conversation because then I think that'd be really something that's going to be really interesting. Like what's going to happen within 12 months? Like, because that's a realistic time frame that people would have made more experience with the system, with the systems you build, you would have learned more about like the usage. There might be some examples. Maybe there's the morning show battle already going on um, because all the feedback I'm seeing, like people are super excited and super interested in that topic. And I think we should really, 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 um, get back to that in a year where we know more because a lot of the stuff we're talking about is a, it's a lot of hypoth hypothetical hypothetical yeah. topics right now and i think we really should um should should hone back and, and then be back in a year or so well just april, make a mark april 2024 i'm i'm in okay <laughs> absolutely on the calendar. <laughs> so just right. to, to wrap up just received a text from a, a program director saying fascinating but scary technology one of the best webinars you've done and hope life is treating you well so um, Daniel, uh, thank you so much for your time and insight and also paving the way because somebody was going to do it. And uh, at least it's coming from a guy that, you know, we could tell from your introduction and your history, you've had a passion and love of radio from a very, very young age. So um, if there's going to be a, a guy leading the way, I'd rather have that guy than some Silicon Valley guy. Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I you know, I believe I'm very passionate about our industry and I believe in in radio's ability to make a real difference in lives around the world. And so uh, it's, it's a, it's, we treat this as a, a really important responsibility to bring artificial intelligence in a productive way into our industry and, uh, and appreciate the, the opportunity to talk about it today. Yeah, it was welcome. fascinating. It was like really fascinating. Thanks and that's, for making the time. Down there. I know some people are going to reach out to you based on the conversation. There's Daniel's details. I want to say thanks to our producer, Robbie, for help making this happen. A Thanks, copy Robbie. of this webinar will be posted tomorrow at the P1 Media Group site and Benstown site, also our YouTube channel and all our social channels. So if you want to watch it again or share it, uh, feel free to do that. And of course, you can catch the entire Global Radio Ideas series on demand anytime at p1mediagroup.com. So we're back next month with one of America's top programmers, a man who has programmed some of the biggest radio stations in New York City including Light FM for many, many years and WCBS FM, uh, where he recently lost Scott Shannon to retirement. So, um, you know, how do you survive that? Losing one of the best DJs in history from your morning show. So, I'll have a guy who maybe answer that question, like who sits in the middle, like it's called Daniel. He can basically clone like uh, Scott Shannon. <laughs> AI Scott. So uh, join us on Thursday, May 12th, when we chat with Jim Ryan. And on behalf of our guest today, Daniel and Benstown and P1, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon. Thank you guys. Thanks, Daniel, for making the Thanks time. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Daniel. See ya. Bye bye.